Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. End of day. Need that eat, sleep, sass song pumping. Um, so Ryan Burke, uh, formerly head of sales at Envision. Uh, now I'm working on the uh, international expansion. So we're here to talk about how do you build and ultimately manage a high performance sales teams. So we've got three sales ninjas here. We're going to talk about um, you know, their role, the trajectory that they're on, and how they specifically manage teams. So I'll let you guys introduce yourself if you guys want to talk maybe a little bit about kind of your role, the company, and then specifically the sales motion that you guys oversee. I think that'll give context. We'll get into the panel and then we'll do some Q&A. Cool? Awesome. Very cool. Glenn? Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Glenn Cahill. I uh, head up a commercial for EMEA based out of Dublin here. We have about 100 people in uh, New Relic in Dublin for EMEA HQ. Um, the company New Relic, it's publicly quoted, um, and we're at about 350 million turnover, aiming for 1 billion in uh, four years, um, FY22, five years. And um, yeah, so we're, uh, I'm, I'm here just under two years, and, and my role was to take New Relic from sort of startup phase in EMEA uh, to, to more of a scale up um, setup. We'll talk about that later. Great. Thanks for inviting me, good to be here. So I'm from Box, as you can all see. <laughs> um, and Box is a, a platform that provides um, enterprise customers the ability to manage their content in a secure and compliant way. So that's sharing content, governing their content, building processes for their content. Uh, we were founded in 2005, so we're 12 years old, IPO two years ago. We've now got 1,700 uh, employees globally, uh, 76,000 enterprise customers globally as well. And I'm responsible for our EMEA operations um, across commercial and uh, enterprise, as well as our marketing uh, uh, activities as well, and customer success. And we've got offices in London, uh, Munich, Paris, Amsterdam, and Stockholm. The way we're set up, very simple. Um, we have an inside sales team that looks after all the organizations that have less than 2,000 employees. We service that out of London. I and mean, everything else is in field in region, so from 2,000 and above. Great. Great. And I'm Stephen Brody. I'm director of inside sales for the Americas at MuleSoft. Uh, MuleSoft is a company that is helping the world change and innovate faster by connecting their disparate data applications and devices. And just to give you an idea of the scale that I've seen since, since joining MuleSoft, uh, three years ago when I came on board, my team was about a team of 10, all based in San Francisco. I've now got six teams spread across five offices in two countries, and it's currently a team of about 55, 60. So we've experienced some massive changes. When I came on board, we were a privately held company. Now we're a publicly traded company, and we've seen a ton of momentum in the market. That's crazy. Awesome. Uh, so to kick it off, why don't we t start with just like the topic, right? So high performance teams. Um, I guess the, it'd be interesting to get you know, your definition of high performance, right? Obviously from sales, it's a metrics driven organization, but like how do you guys sort of define high performance? Where do you wanna go? You know, we're not gonna go left or right. All right, I'll start first then, shall I? Sure. Um, so matrix are important, the numbers are important. Um, I have uh, no hesitation in saying that. But I guess we'd all agree, hopefully, that um, the metrics are a lag indicator as opposed to a lead yeah. indicator. So, I'm personally more energized and focused on some of the lead indicators, which tend to be a little bit more qualitative about a high-performing team, high-performing sales team. So I tend to look at some qualitative measures, such as you know, does the sales team in any particular region, actually is the sales strategy, is the plan you know, laddering nicely up to the corporate plan? Is there a tight yep. interlock there? Um, I look at the individuals in the team and think, you know, reflect on, you know, are they showing up to work in a way that role models our values? Um, are they positive? Are they energetic? Are they enthusiastic about the future? Yep. Um, I look at indicators such as you know, do other people internally and externally want to join that team? That's a great indicator because success breeds success and success attracts successful people as well. So, you know, because I'm running a uh, full range of sales functions, I look to see does my inside sales team, do the individual contributors there, do they aspire to go into field? Yep. Yeah. And do my SDRs and OBRs, do they aspire to go into inside sales? That's a great indicator of the health of the organization. So I guess it's more about the, the health index. Uh, and if you've got a great and healthy uh, sales organization, 
I strongly believe it leads to high performance as well. Yep. Cool. Yeah, and I came from Army Special Operations, and we had this idea of the big five. Like, we always had five areas of focus that we used to measure the efficacy of the team, or the effectiveness of the team, rather. And at MuleSoft, I think, in any sales team, it really boils down to a lot of what you said, which I distill down to the big three. Like, first and foremost, quantitative performance, right? At the end of the day, you exist to drive in to hit a number. Second one is culture, right? Do people actually want to get out of bed on a Monday morning and show up to work? And when you build that great culture, it really helps drive the third one, which is recruiting. And like you said, when you have all three of those in place, it really creates this virtuous cycle where success begets success. Like, eagles want to soar with eagles. And for me, ultimately, what we're looking to drive, especially because I'm working with a lot of early career salespeople, is build the kind of sales brand where people say, wow, you sold at MuleSoft. Like, yep. that's incredible. This, this, this gal knows how to sell. Let's bring her on board. Yep, yep. Great, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that all rings very true. The, the other thing I'd add is that you need to have, in each team, you need to have the, the right people um, uh, given uh, the freedom to express themselves in the motion that they're best at. You do get people who are naturally better at, at doing the, um, the dynamic, high-velocity um, drive-by selling. You do get people who are more naturally oriented to relationship building. You get people who are, you know, good at, you know, doing a, a quarterback in a, a one-off yep. deal. You get people who are great at building a long-term vision. So I think if you can have the individuals within the teams as well playing to their strengths, then that'll really help the, the collective. Yeah, and I, you know, you talk about some of the attributes of the salespeople, and uh, you know, that kind of bleeds into hiring. Obviously, mm -hmm. super important. Um, like when you think about prioritizing what those key attributes are that you're looking for, you know, for a high performer, like what would those be? Yeah, I look at three things again. Maybe I just like the rule of three a little too yeah. much. Um, but first and foremost, are you an A player? Like, do you have a track record of excellence where you can either show with quantitative or qualitative data that you are amongst the best of the best, the top 1% of your respective peer group? Does that have to be within sales? Not necessarily, especially because it's early career sales hires. Yeah. I think later on in your career, it should be. Yep. Although I would warn that oftentimes that can be misleading, right? Because you might have just landed in a territory that just happened to take off. Yep. So that's why that long track record rather than spurts of excellence is really critical. Yep. That trajectory is just as important as, as the altitude that you're at. I think the second thing is, do your values, does your personal mission align with our set of core values and our mission and the values of this team? And that's critically important because our values were actually built bottoms up. We said, what do the best people in this company on our team do well? Yep. And what traits and attributes do they actually have? We actually did like a qualitative and quantitative analysis of that. And we used that to really predicate what those values should be. And then the third thing, and I think this is actually critically important and it's often missed in sales, and especially with early career sales hires is, is this the right role for you? Like, it's really easy to get excited about coming on board at a hyper-growth company like MuleSoft where you know you're going to be working with the best of the best. You know that you're a clear leader in the market. You know that you've got a ton of momentum. But do you actually want to do this role? Because one of the traits and attributes we've seen has the highest correlation to success in our organization is how passionate you are about sales. Got it. Anything else on the attributes? Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you also look at it, the, um, you need people who are, you know, highly driven, motivated to perform for their own internal needs, whatever, being driven by whatever it is, be that, be that money, career status, whatever. Um, but you need those people to also be able to operate within a team environment, either that's within with their peers or with uh, a, a support structure, particularly when you're trying to scale up and you're looking at larger customers, <coughs> larger deals, longer time horizons. So I think it's really important that people are able to, to demonstrate both of those capabilities, because obviously you'll go for somebody who's, who's individually motivated, driven, competent, and, and has a track record, as Stephen mentioned. But I think you need people who are able to kind of fit in, grow, and develop. I think that's the second point, is that particularly you know, in, the, in the small to medium-sized companies, is that what's expected of those people will change a little bit over time. Yep. I personally think you should be looking to hire people who are right for the role maybe 12 months down the line. You're gonna have a six to nine month ramp or whatever, depending on how technical your product is anyway. So when they're really hitting productivity, when they're really starting to bring value to the company, when they're really starting to look attractive and valuable to other, other competitors, 
you really want to have the right person for that role. So not so much hiring for the, the guy who's going to come in and knock down all the leads, but you know, hiring for the, the girl who's going to be able to cultivate the relationships to build that, that uh, sustainable business. Um, and just to add to that, I mean, I agree with most of that, so we just uh, maybe add a, a little bit of um, uh, difference as well. So, obviously, we focus on hiring the right person, but I think it's also our responsibility to make sure we don't hire the wrong person. Mm -hmm. um, and we've all been in that situation where you've got a vacancy, you know you've got to fill it, and you're, you've got someone in front of you, and they're ticking most of the boxes, but there's one or two nagging doubts. Uh, my strong advice is don't hire them. You know, we have a philosophy in Box, which is never have a permanent reminder of a temporary feeling. Yep. Yeah, because that will be a permanent reminder if you get the wrong person in the job. And the cost of hiring the wrong person is astronomical, particularly in some of our European countries. Um, the guys have talked about sort of early stage uh, um, sales hires as well. If I just flip that onto the more experienced ones. So in our evolution now, similar to you guys, we're, we're on our path to a billion uh, growth expectations as well. And our early stage sales reps tend to focus on the most sort of velocity transactional deals. But to realize some of the goals that we have uh, on our path to billion, you know, we've got to do multi-million dollar deals. We've got to go deep and wide into all of our organizations. So over the last six months, we've been balancing that out, hiring more seasoned, more experienced uh, enterprise sales reps who have got deep relationships with the people we sell to, CIOs, CS, CSOs, CPOs, etc. cetera. Uh, they have the patience as well to actually nurture a big deal. Yep. Um, and they, you know, they bring a lot of value to us. So you know, we've been knocking out uh, quarter and quarter improved in poor performance. Uh, record performance is the biggest transaction in the last quarter in our history as well. And that's all down to bringing in uh, a sort of different breed of, of sales uh, uh, individual, more experienced one. And actually, there's a rich pool of people out there. I mean, one of the benefits we have, I think, working in our industry is that some of the legacy organizations are doing a great job disenfranchising some fantastic mm -hmm. salespeople. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're shrinking their territories, they're increasing their quotas, uh, and they're putting caps on their accelerators. Go after those guys, because they can do a really good job for you. Yep. Yeah, I think, I don't know who said it, but the uh, sort of the, the analogy that every hire, every new hire is, is a rock, right? And you're either going to put that in your pocket and weigh you down, or you're going to be taking it out of your pocket, and it's going to make you more flexible and more nimble. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always curious about sort of asking sales leaders like their interview questions, right? Because there's a lot of different attributes that we're, that we're trying to get. Like, do you guys have any favorite interview questions that you feel like uncover some of the things you talked about? So just uh, to build on what I just said there about the more experienced ones, then, and so I hire them because of the relationships they have. So one yep. of the interview questions, in fact, I did one just the, uh, the other day, and my interview question was, Show me your phone and show me the text of the top 10 CIOs you've been in communicating with by text over the last few weeks. Because I need to know that they've got that relationship in there. Uh, and when you're doing a multi-million dollar deal and going to ELA in an organization, you've got to have that some person inside who's coaching you offline. Yep. And that's often done by text. So if they can't show me the text of the CIOs mm -hmm. they're communicating with, they don't have the relationships. Yep. Yeah, I, sometimes, you know, people are, are pretty well coached, they're pretty, uh, it, it sometimes can be difficult to go through, you, you can often find yourself going through interviews, going through emotions, and it's like both of you have, you know, had the script before, and you're kind of, uh, people are very well coached. I sometimes find if I, you know, throw in a blatantly negative question, you know, that it really mm -hmm. brings out something, a little bit more of an emotional yeah. response, it's like, what do you hate about your job right now? Yeah. You know? And if the answer is no, well then, why are you here? You know, you got to give me something here on this, yeah. and because uh, nobody likes to really come out with that kind of stuff in an interview. But you'll you'll probably find a path worth pursuing yep. in that, and it may be absolutely valid. But uh, I find that one useful. Yep. Yeah, I, I would add. You know, David, you're talking about hiring reps who are going to go and drive a highly complex enterprise sale where you're driving real, tangible business outcomes, and that's that's the core of MuleSoft's business. You know, we're selling to. 45% of the global 500 are our customers, and we're engaged at the C-suite. So trying to suss out if an early career sales hire is going to be capable of really demonstrating the level of grit, right? That persistence and passion to persevere over a long period of time yep. is really critical because a lot of times reps who fail tend to look outwards and externalize blame. So one question I love to ask is, you know, hey, just tell me about a time you were set up for failure. And the great reps will say, well, I mean, can't really think of a time I was set up for failure, but one time something that happened to me was X, and what I did about it was Y, and the impact was Z. Yep. So, sorry for the algebra there. Yeah, no worries, no <laughs> worries. Um, 
So now is, you know, sort of bleeds into, into the onboarding, right? I think the, uh, the founder of, of uh, New Relic actually said it once from a product perspective, one of the biggest indicators of churn is your onboarding, mm -hmm. right? And I think that relates to, you know, hiring people as well. So um, how do you guys feel about sort of onboarding new reps? And is there anything interesting that you guys do that sort of immediately gets them to align with your culture, your process? So I'm not sure if it's, if it's qualifies as interesting or not, but at Box, uh, everyone, whether you're a sales uh, person or not, the first week is spent uh, in HQ in, in Silicon Valley, yep. uh, Redwood City. Uh, they spend their first week there going through a new hire orientation program. Yep. It starts off with a, a session with our founders uh, to talk about the culture of the organization, and it then moves into product training and then your individual functional training. For our sales guys, then they come back to their respective uh, local office, and that's followed up with uh, and a program we call Accelerate. It's an 11-week program of modules which we've uh, built on the back of challenger sales and a bit of Hoffman negotiating skill, uh, skills. So it's teach, tailor, take control, yep. and uh, create uh, constructive tension. Um, and what we've actually found is that um, for those reps who go through that process and religiously do the 11 modules versus those who don't, there's a 30% increase in ramp time. So we're pretty myopic about making sure the guys do go through it. You know, even the seasoned guys, they go through the, uh, yep. the onboarding in a systematic way. Yep. And I think people want to be treated, you know, when they arrive in, particularly day one, want to be treated as special. So the, the very sm small things at the very start. I mean, you can see now there's a, a lot of... Um, new starter inflation going on, people tweeting their, uh, their welcome packs, you know, they're getting more and more, um, getting more and more expensive. The, the Bose headphones are now becoming uh, a, uh, a standard. So they want to be treated special in, in that way. I think even the fact that, you know, sometimes as somebody, a previous speaker mentioned, the disadvantage having remote HQs like on the West Coast, but yeah. it's nice to send people away for the, uh, for our, the Ignite program in our case, um, to the West Coast and really get immersed in the, in the company culture. Spend a, spend a, a week doing formal training, spend a week with a buddy doing your, uh, doing your job there. I think another thing that, that we learned and that we changed um, within the Ignite program was we, we were doing a very broad coverage of here's what you need to do to do your job successfully. And we found that it was taking people a couple of months to actually master all the skills necessary to exploit that. And rather what really people desperately needed in the early days was to have some quick wins, have some successes, to make yeah. some sales, to, to score some deals. And, and you know, again, that sounds like you know, pretty tactical. But that, I think, really helped people to, to develop. So if you give somebody the skills to, and particularly for us, it's a pretty technical product, like possibly some of the others, you know, the, the minimum you need to know to sell this thing and set you up with a decent set of leads to score you know, a couple of modest-sized yeah. deals, that really boosts people's confidence and drives them on to, to further success. And it's much easier to build on from there. Yeah. yeah, and there's a common thread with all of us, and that's that I think there's a strong emphasis on fundamental sales skills and your sales swing and approach rather than just necessarily over rotating even with a highly complex product to just drilling down on product. Yep. I think the best sales people can sell anything. But for us when we're getting early career sales hires, we actually take absolutely everyone who's coming to the team whether they're based in Atlanta or London and we fly them out to San Francisco for 4 weeks and put them through a sort of best in industry 4 week tech sales MBA program, as we call it, and it is very heavily oriented on practical application of the concepts that they're learning, but it's also very heavily oriented on having them come to understand the sort of um, outcome-based sales process that we're driving. Yep. I think yep. another thing as well is, you know, as, you, as we develop these programs, I like the name, by the way, the Tech Sales MBA, I'd like to do that, but um, the, uh, is, you know, we do of necessity have a one-size-fits-all, uh, you know, onboarding, induction, Ignite program, whatever, and it's important to try to, to nuance that a little bit because, you know, you know big-ticket enterprise sales guys have different needs from SDRs, and, and if you're throwing in the sales engineers or the solution folks into the mix as well, again, it's different, so I think you need to, to multi-thread it to yep. some extent. Yep. So now that you have the folks on board, like how do you feel about, you know, you guys only have so much time, right? And if you think about sort of the, the management, the reporting, the administration, the coaching, the training, like how do you guys feel like you're prioritizing your time to manage and optimize your team? Hmm. So um, proportionately, I spend maybe 30% of my time um, obviously working on the, the company plan, the vision, uh, increasing the brand awareness of the company, doing things like this. But I try and uh, separate my time in around about 30% or so, um, obviously with customers, and a balancing 30% with my teams. And that means, obviously, 
not just uh, group sessions, one-to-one -one skip level sessions as well. So I'm constantly trying to take the pulse of the organization yep. through those direct engagements. So that's how I typically <coughs> spend my time. Yep. Yeah, I guess that have a similar mix. I mean, the amount of time though, I don't have 100% of time for the team because you're gonna have to give a, you know, a, a 20 or 30% proportion to managing up to the HQ. Um, so what I do try is to try to combine a lot of the, um, the coaching and the customer stuff with um, just working on deals with, with individuals. So just pick a few deals per quarter, get involved in those. Yep. And then the, you know, the, the coaching and, and so on is, um, is inherent in that. Yeah, I, I'd say with teams across five offices, the single greatest point of leverage I have is the managers, those frontline managers who are on the ground there. So I try to spend as much time as possible with them. But I go back again to the big three. If it's recruiting, performance, and driving a great culture, I want to yep. make sure that you know on a quarterly, monthly, weekly basis, the order of those priorities might flip-flop, but ultimately everything I'm doing should be driving towards those big three. Yep, no, that makes sense. Um, back to the management, like managing the team and the metrics we talked about at the beginning, like what's an interesting KPI that you guys use that maybe is, you know, obviously revenue and, and kind of the, the quota achievement, but are there any other interesting metrics that you guys use to measure and optimize your team? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, cons the customer's consumption is uh, yep. and, and whatever format that might take, depending on what your your offering is. But the number of users, the frequency that they and you're measuring the salespeople on that. No, but what I was going to say was, if you look at the the customer's consumption, be it logins, yep. time, a number of users, seniority of those users, etc., and then look at the deals, you're going to have a see a, some correlation between the deals that will succeed and the ones that won't. Basically, low consumption, uh, aiming to do a big deal, it's just yep. not going to happen. So I, I I started to stack rank customers and opportunities based on the the end customer's uh, consumption and, and get a good idea as to where to focus from there. Got it. Um, we've got stacks of data, stacks of KPIs. <laughs> I look at two things primarily. Number one, capacity. And that is, you know, based upon the number of uh, AEs I have in post and their roll up of their quotas, do I have enough capacity to over exceed my goal? Um, essentially, and what I'm looking at on a daily basis uh, is, do I have enough firepower in the organization? And that's what we call capacity. Yep. Linked to that, I then look at uh, regretted attrition, because there's nothing worse, there's no bigger killer to capacity than losing a fully ramped rep and replacing them with a ramping rep. Kills your capacity. So I'm constantly looking at capacity and trying to hire ahead of the curve. Yep. Yeah, and I think that, the, again, just finding common threads here, I think the, the key is having a focused set of core metrics that you're monitoring, but I'd say even more importantly, one thing we do much better now than we were doing three years ago is ensuring that everyone's operating off the same sheet of music. So we're all looking at the same dashboards across every region, and we have you know, managers reporting those out cross-functionally to their sort of cross-functional counterparts, and ensuring that that reporting cadence and delivery is really tight yep. and very regular. Yep. Cool. So we've only got a couple minutes left. I do want to get to some questions. Maybe the last one for the panel uh, before we get. Like, you guys are starting a new team from scratch tomorrow. Like what's one thing you're going to do differently uh, based on what you've uh, built today? Ooh. You go first. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess the, what, what I would do is just make sure I have a, an, an EMEA appropriate model from, uh, in terms of, you mentioned the capacity plan, which, you know, was super important. And so an EMEA, an EMEA centric capacity plan, I think, is, is that takes account of, of language and, this, and segmentation, which will be different country by country. I think that's really important. Um, I think that, and we've taken the opportunity to learn lessons based upon the different countries we've gone into. So the most recent one we've gone into is Germany. And it probably ties into one of the questions I can see on the screen here as well, which is that we've done it differently with Germany than we have done it in any other country, which is we've hired a player coach first and then the reps afterwards. Yep. Uh, whereas previously we went in and we hired our first rep in a region and left them on their own. Yep. So um, I think we've learned the lesson there and it actually it's proven quite successful for us. And I would just say focus on hiring the person that you're going to need 18 months in seat but can still do the job today. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Cool. So we've got a minute, so we'll go to a couple of the questions. Uh, hire expensive, competent salespeople or coach inexpensive, motivated salespeople. Anybody want that? I mean, hopefully everybody's competent, but... One uh, thing, uh, I'd link it to the question I just answered, um, but I'd also say it depends on what country you're in. So uh, hiring expensive people based upon countries and the individual employment regulations is something you need to be very, very careful about. I think as, as well it depends on the motion you're, you're trying to do. If you, <coughs> if you really just want to be a, a, a lead-driven transactional 
or you're at that stage of your growth, then maybe you can get away with motivated people who can be coached to success. But if you are looking to, ha to scale with uh, bigger customers, bigger deals, longer time spans, more complexity, you're going to have to go with people that have the track record that yep. Stephen was talking about earlier. And, and that kind of goes to the next question around, um, or the question around, you know, 1.5 million in ARR, building out a sales team from scratch. Any advice on what you guys would do in terms of who you would hire? Yeah, I, I, so I did this at Evolve. I think the thing that you want to make sure you're doing is you're not hiring too far ahead. Like I've seen yep. some startups, or I talked to some people here actually over the course of this event who hired you know, sales managers or VPs before they hired a salesperson who could just come in and figure out if you even have product market fit. Um, so I would just say don't hire too far ahead. Yep. Um, one interesting one on the, um, we talked a little bit about the metrics I feel like, but from the tools, like tools and technology perspective, mm -hmm. like we've all got a million tools, but is there anything that you guys feel like you couldn't live without? We have one thing, we actually created it internally in Box, um, and it's absolutely awesome. So think about the amount of time your reps spend, or you individually as well spend, either going to existing customers or new customers, and you've got to create a deck. So you've got to create a PowerPoint deck that's going to include some information about the customer, maybe their business, uh, some reference customers, et cetera. Now we've created something called Auto Pitch in Box. Yeah, you press a button, 30 seconds, it goes to the web or internally, pulls all the data together, puts it into a PowerPoint deck, you take it off with you. It saves an nice. awesome amount of time. So before I go and see any customer, I press that button, get my PowerPoint deck pre-done, tailored to the customer, and off I go. Yeah, I'd say the most interesting tool on the market right now is people.ai. Yeah. And the reason it's so interesting is I'm sure all of you have struggled with the fact that your account executives, especially your senior account executives, don't like to log activity. They don't like to attach contacts to opportunities. They don't like to associate roles to them. And it can actually go and automatically do that without them doing anything, let alone them even necessarily knowing they're using the tool. And on top of that, you can actually take your data and retroactively log everyone they've ever talked to and associate it to accounts and opportunities. I think it's a total paradigm shift, um, potential game changer. Yeah, it's going to go on, uh, on their website. <laughs> another just a quick one is, you know, AI is starting to play more of a role in, yeah. uh, in sales. And there's a, there's a number of tools out there that are just helping, providing that kind of uh, sales coaching kind of function. Mm -hmm. um, a curated schedule for, uh, for reps. Uh, so we use Engageo in New Relic. And that's been really good for us, particularly then as we're trying to move up the food chain a little bit. We're trying to automate the, uh, the lower end transactions through self-serve and so on a little bit more and then point reps towards the, the richer playing fields further up the stack. Awesome. Well, we are out of time. We're getting the flashing red light. So uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, thanks for everybody to, for, uh, for coming. And uh, that's it. Great. Thanks. thanks.